Welcome! This is an introduction to EWT, which the E stands for energy, and so we're going to begin with an introduction to energy and how it flows. But first, we're going to imagine a scenario with no energy. Right? Imagine a pool of no water, which is flat and motionless, and so there's no energy in that pool. And then now let's imagine an earthquake shakes that pool, such that water molecules are now bouncing around in all different directions eventually creating waves, and that pool is considered to have energy. And that energy can be useful, right? It might cause the motion of an object. Let's assume it's a beach ball on the surface. And this is what it would look like. It's going to move to the point of minimal amplitude. It's being forced. Right? The minimal wave amplitude is the, the height, so it's going to go lower in height, at least in a transverse wave. Now waves have a property called wave interference. This is where waves combine to increase or decrease their amplitude. So let's just say two waves in the same phase of equal amplitude. This is called 1x amplitude. Same phase combined and becomes 2x amplitude. But its energy is always conserved. Right, and so what is that energy? And how do you calculate it? You can calculate it based on these four things. The wave speed, the wavelength between the two waves, its amplitude, and then lastly, the density of something that's traveling in the, uh, the medium. Well, let's apply this now to the universe. We use a water wave analogy, but let's imagine a universe of wave energy, and we can describe it based on two fundamental components that allow this transfer of energy. And so the white one is going to be called granules, and that black one is going to be called wave centers. And this process of transferring energy, just like the water molecules, as one bounces and transfers to the next, or even air molecules uh, in air for sound waves bouncing from one to the next, um, that process can also be illustrated here. But those are molecules are hard to imagine, so imagine it's maybe something more physical like a billiard ball. Crashing from one into the next one that you see there is number two, and basically transferring its energy so that second one moves forward. But now a billiard ball hits a wall and reflects, and you see that process here. Or maybe it's an air molecule bouncing off an elastic balloon, but you can visualize now how these granules might be transferring energy from one to the next and then reflecting off something and transferring its energy in the opposite direction. Now there's many, many of these that are moving. And so they transfer energy now in sinusoidal waves, such as this, with a distance of separation known as a wavelength at a certain speed. And there's the reflection. So speed and wavelength. And it looks something a little bit more like this as uh, each and every one of those travels. You can see it bouncing or uh, going in and bouncing out. And that right there is a wavelength in the dark bands. That's a longitudinal wavelength, a little bit different than uh, transverse waves, which we'll get to in a second. So that's a longitudinal wavelength, and amplitude is a little bit trickier to explain. Uh, amplitude here is uh, measured in a red dot, which is the distance that each one of those granules is traveling from equilibrium. Now, while the wavelength remains the same, you can see that the distance that it's being traveled that is traveling is um, greater near the core and it is uh, less as it moves out that red dot to the far left there is traveling a smaller distance than the one near the core. Its energy is always conserved but as it spreads out spherically it has to transfer energy to more and more granules and as a result it is reducing its amplitude as you get further from the center. Now one nice thing about having consistent uh, wavelength, that longitudinal wavelength at least, is that uh, wavelength and frequency are related uh, by speed, and then time is related on frequency. And what that allows you to do is measure something in time which is repetitive cycles of waves. Now, because this would be flowing through every particle, that means that everything from the cesium atom that measures our clocks to pendulum uh, like the in a grandfather clock, for example, everything should be beating at the same rate. 
when not in motion. However, another nice property of waves is that when it is in motion, there's going to be a change in that wavelength, and that leaves the open the possibility for relative time based on the Doppler effect. And that'll be uh, discussed in upcoming videos. But back to one of those four properties I mentioned earlier. One is density. And what is density? It's the mass of something in a given uh, volume. And so volume will also be uh, required for the calculation of energy, but this is a, a variable. And the, the two most important volumes that are calculated in EWTE are, are spheres and cylinders. And you see the equations there. So that covers density and volume. And then you package that all up with the four uh, variables for, for waves that I mentioned earlier, speed, wavelength, amplitude, and density in a given volume, V, and there's the equation for energy. And we'll use this later for the calculations of particles and, and photons and much more. But the other thing that's important to remember for energy is the conservation of energy. And so first we'll describe two different wave types. One is longitudinal, right, where the granules are moving in the same direction as the wave is propagating. And then compare that to a transverse wave, where the granules move perpendicular now to the direction that the wave is propagating. But energy is always conserved. If you were to take a look at the, what goes into those boxes and what comes out of those boxes, the energy will always be equal. If you look at what's occurring individually is the transfer of energy from one granule to the next. So these two wave types are going to be important to remember. And for transverse waves, we covered longitudinal uh, wavelength and amplitude earlier. The transverse wavelength will be variable, uh, so will amplitude. And so it was given a subnotation here of T to distinguish the difference. Uh, and these are going to be variables, and we're going to see that in photons. One more thing about waves is the form. They can be traveling or they can also be standing in form. And a, and a standing wave is when you have waves of uh, same uh, frequency traveling in opposite directions and it might form a wave such as this where it just appears to be going up and down. Now there's no net propagation of energy, so it's sort of like stored energy, but yet there is still energy in there. You can see how things are moving. It's just no net propagation of, of energy in a standing wave. Now, standing waves, because these are spherical waves, really, uh, they're very difficult to, to visualize, but this is a computer simulation of one, and it's the addition of that in wave to the far left plus an out wave that's being reflected there, and the combination of those two produces the standing wave on the right. And that's an illustration of a spherical standing wave and as best can, you know, three-dimensional view. But since they are so hard to visualize, uh, icons are used throughout EWT and, and these videos. And the icons that you'll see, uh, starting with the top left quadrant there, is uh, an icon for the longitudinal standing wave. Bottom left you see the uh, longitudinal traveling wave. And then in the bottom right quadrant you see two different icons for waves that are traveling but are transverse. And one is going to be as a result of particle vibration and the other for spin. And these will be used in upcoming videos. But a little bit about force and motion. And really it's not only the cause of all forces but all part of creation. It's just one simple rule. It's a rule to minimize wave amplitude. Much like that beach ball on the surface of the water that moves to minimize its wave amplitude or height in that case. Same thing happens here but it's different for standing waves and for traveling waves. In a standing wave, there, is, there are two nodes per wavelength that is point of minimal amplitude, which is essentially zero as those waves combine. And that allows a position for, for wave centers. In a traveling wave, it's going to be a combination constructive or destructive wave interference. And its rule is still going to be to minimize wave amplitude, but it may not necessarily always be the point where amplitude is zero, yet it will still be the same rule of minimizing wave amplitude. So there will be more on forces later too. But first, on energy. Energy is always conserved, but it will be shown that it can be transformed between wave types, such as 
traveling waves uh, being reflected from wave centers and creating standing waves, such as particles spinning to create transverse waves, or a different type of wave being created from vibration, but also a, a transverse wave. And all of this is energy, all of it is waves, but we view it differently based on their wave type. Right? We know these as particles or photons, uh, or we measure it as forces between particles, like the electric force or the magnetic force. And each of these will have a video in EWT, and we'll cover particles and forces and, and photons and more. But the important thing here to remember is that all of it is based on energy, and energy is the motion of a medium flowing as waves with the capacity to do work. And it may change waveforms, but its energy will always be conserved.